All right, so uh, our first reader is Helen Marshall, and uh, she, well, let me finish. You may not want to applaud out there. Um, anyway, she's an Aurora-nominated uh, poet, and uh, you can find her at manuscriptgal.com, and she's an author, editor, and self-proclaimed bibliophile. Her poetry has been published in uh, Cheezine, NFG, Abyss and Apex, and the long-running Tesseract's anthology series. Her poem, Waiting for the Harrowing, has been nominated for the 2011 Aurora Award, so you should all go vote for that. And Mist and Shadows, which was originally in Starline, appeared in the 2006 Risling Anthology, which is the best SF uh, uh, specific poetry. Uh, her new collection of poems called Skeleton Leaves from Kelp Queen Press is, just came out and we've got copies of it here and I think she's going to read from that and also some fiction and her collection of short stories, Hair Side, Flesh Side, is forthcoming from some people called Cheesy in Publications in 2012. Um, she's also pursuing a PhD because she never sleeps um, in medieval studies at UT and she says she spends a great deal of her time staring at 14th century manuscripts unwisely because when you look into a book, who knows what might be looking back. So, and uh, she does have many famous authors who are fans of hers. Um, Chaucer, for example, said that her work was uh, better than cats and he would read it again and again. And we all know that if Chaucer was anything, he was a fond, fond of musical theater, especially involving feelings. So, without further ado, my very good friend, Helen Marshall. like the eyes of the first woman you loved. Electricity has replaced fireflies as the primary source of light. Who needs a trail of breadcrumbs to navigate the London tube? There are easier ways to travel than in a house on chicken legs at seven leagues a stride. Your shadow has escaped you and without a needle and a thread, it shall roam free. It knows her, the first woman you loved, knows how to find her braid of hair dangling from the 10th story window knows the name to call. One night, perhaps, you shall turn a corner to see them dancing, his hand upon her hip. He is sharper in her gaze, and though you trace his steps, the steps you learn together, her smile is only for him. You are but a shadow cast upon the street. My next reading is a, is a bit longer, so uh, I hope you enjoy it. It was three weeks to her birthday when the big box came, each of the moving men grunting and sweating as they heaved drunkenly to the spot where Chloe used to park her 10-speed. Chloe had been told to move it to the backyard, where it now leaned up against the fence, exposed to the elements, shining ribbons soggy from last night's rain. But that was okay, because she knew what this was, what it had to be. She was so tingly with excitement that it didn't matter if the gears of her 10-speed rusted out. Her parents took her by the hand, one on either side, her mom on her right, her dad on her left, and they walked into the garage to see. It's for you, honey, her mom, her other mom, said with the biggest smile, it's just for you. It's from Italy, said her dad. We brought it all this way to celebrate. Your birthday's not for another couple of weeks, but, well, sweetheart, we wanted you to have something early. Something from us, her mom cut in, before you go back home. And they looked at each other encouragingly, and they looked at her encouragingly. But Chloe, Chloe was hardly listening because she was looking at the box. It was very big, as long as her bed, made of thick wooden slats with hick, yakit, sepultus, written in bold red letters. Go ahead, sweetheart, said her mom. Go on and open it. David, tell her to open it. It's okay, said her dad. Here, sweetie, fetch me the crowbar. 
And Chloe brought him the large hooked crowbar, and he fit it under the lid, the crate, and after some more grunting and heaving, off it came with a pop. A smell filled the air like dirt and old things. It made Chloe feel all warm and tingly. Is it, she asked, but her dad was lifting her up onto his shoulders. Shh, honey, see for yourself. Now, at first all she could make out was a layer of straw and the cloud of dust that leapt into the air as her dad began to root around. But she still couldn't see what was inside the thing, not through the settling dust and her dad's rooting arms, and she had to hold tight around his neck so she didn't fall off. But then, then, there was something peeking through, brown and leathery, something that might have been a football, except it wasn't a football because her dad was still clearing and Chloe saw it, a face, and more than that, a face with pale stringy hair tangled up in the straw, and a brown leathery neck, and through its thin twiggy arms, and thinner, twiggier fingers. Her dad bounced her on his shoulders and then heaved her off again, so she landed gently on the ground. And she stood, tiptoed, until she could see over the top of the crate. Chloe fingered the straw shyly, not daring to touch it, not daring to stroke the soft, leathery skin. For your birthday, kiddo, you're almost seven and we wanted you to have this, he said in a warm, excited voice. Lucia of Syracuse, her mom interrupted and gave her a look. But it was an affectionate look, one that showed her dad didn't mind much. She died 304 AD, a real, genuine martyr. Chloe's mouth opened in a little O, and she reached out and let her finger brush against the brown leather cheek. It was rough as a cat's tongue in some places, and smooth as fine-grained wood in others. She was about your age, sweetheart, and they came for her. She wanted, they wanted her to marry some rich governor who thought she had the most beautiful eyes in the world, but she wasn't having any of that. Do you know what she did? She plucked out her eyes, Chloe said, barely a whisper as your finger traced the curves of the eye sockets. That's right, her mum bean. That's exactly right, sweetheart. Now there's a real saint for you, a saint to be proud of. Not just any martyr has that kind of panache. Her dad nodded sagely, and Chloe nodded too, because it was true. This was something. This wasn't one of those knockoff relics that some of the other kids got. There were about five girls in her grade alone who claimed to have Catherine of Siena. And that was nonsense. There was only one Catherine of Siena. We couldn't all have her. <laughs> Melissa Johnstone admitted she only had a finger bone, and it was a hand-me-down from her older sister's Teresa of Avila anyway. Her parents couldn't afford a whole new saint, not for a third kid. But Chloe could tell just by looking that this was the real Lucia, that this little girl, a little girl her own age, had been good and kind and best beloved of all. And then, there, it happened. Chloe felt a warm rush of heat and all the hairs on her arms stood up. This was it, this was the moment. Out of the crate stepped a little girl, the same age as Chloe, with long dark hair and olive skin and a beatific smile. You won't be lonely now when you visit, sweetheart, her dad said. Lucia will be here waiting for you. And afterward they took her inside and there was birthday cake and it was her favorite double chocolate with thick brown icing that seemed to fizz on her tongue, and she was even allowed a second piece. At the end of the night, when she had had as much cake as she could fit inside her, and her eyes were starting to drift shut, they tucked her into bed, one on either side, her mom on the right, her dad on the left, and the third, Lucia, a faint, ghostly little girl shape by the window. Can she come home with me? Please, Dad, Chloe asked dreamily, but her parents shared a look, a special look and her dad crouched down beside her. I need you to listen, sweetheart. He looked up at her mum for support in the way he did sometimes. You can't tell Claire, well, your mother, your mum back home, about this. This is a special present. And because it's a special present, you need to keep it a secret. Chloe looked at her dad, and his eyes were so sad, and so she promised. And when she fell asleep, she dreamed of Lucia bathed in golden light with her beautiful blank eye sockets. And she forgot the sadness in her father's eyes, and she didn't think about what it would be like to go home. In the end, they let her take a finger, only a pinky, from Lucia's right hand where the sinews were weakest with age. She had to promise, cross your heart and hope to die, that she would keep it a secret. Your mother, Claire, at home, she wouldn't like it if she knew. Her other mom said as they packed her overnight things back into the little Hello Kitty suitcase she had brought with her, 
brother Mum was tall and beautiful, with soft, soft hair that she sometimes let Chloe brush. Her mother back home didn't like it when Chloe talked about her. Your father said you were good, you'd be careful, and you'll come back, won't you, sweetheart, to see Lucia? She can't see me, Mum, Chloe replied as she folded her pajamas. She gave away her eyes. Even so, said her other mom. Lucia went with her, of course, but with only the little bony finger, she appeared as the faintest of faint outlines. Chloe didn't care. Lucia filled her with a sense of light and warmth. And no matter how dark it was, she never felt the night terrors with Lucia there. She kept a finger in her pocket when she went to school, and she only showed it to Melissa, because Melissa had a finger too. But you're not supposed to have one yet, Melissa squealed with wide eyes. It's not your birthday. It is too. My parents only see me once a month. It's my special present. But Melissa only muttered darkly, you're not supposed to. Now you'll get two because you have two mums, and I'll only have a lousy finger. She wouldn't look at Chloe for the rest of the day. Later that evening, her mother, her mum at home, received a call from Melissa's mum, and that was it. She demanded to see the finger. It was a gift from them, wasn't it? Well, they know you aren't properly seven yet, and they're trying to get in a present early. She paced about the kitchen. I won't have any of that. I won't have any second-class finger bones in my house. Chloe tried to tell her that they didn't mean anything by it and that it was all right, she didn't need a second saint, but her mother rounded on her fiercely. That's what you think, is it? You don't want mine. Fine, you can make do without any. Then her mom snatched the finger out of her hand and threw it in the garbage disposal. It disappeared in a terrible grinding of gears, so loud that Chloe had to cover her ears. The little ghost girl, just like that, vanished like a burst soap bubble. Oh, I bet you think you're so clever, Chloe overheard through her locked bedroom door that night as she hugged her covers close to her chin. The dark seemed so much darker now, like it had all crowded into the room when her mother closed the door. You think she likes saints, do you? I'll get her a saint. I'll get her Joan of Bloody Ark. And she did. It might have cost a fortune, but her mother, her mum at home, had the scene dredged for ashes. And three weeks later on her birthday, she presented Chloe with a heavy glass pickle jar filled with Parisian mud. <laughs> That'll teach him, she said, grinning sharply at Chloe. You want to try martyrdom? Try burnt at a stake. <laughs> and they sat side by side, a half-eaten slice of carrot cake between them. The candle licked clean of icing and her mother glaring at the jar, waiting for something to happen. By 10.30, it was getting quite late and Chloe was starting to get sleepy. It was past her bedtime, but her mother gripped her wrist fiercely. She's there, it just takes longer. She was roasted alive for Christ's sake, but she'll come, she'll come, and you and I are going to wait here until she does. And they did, and 10.30 became 11, and 11 became 11.30, and when the last chime sounded for midnight, with a harump, her mother pretended not to look when Chloe slipped her arm away and climbed the stairs to her bedroom closing the door herself, even with all the darkness crammed into that little room. But in the morning when she wandered down the stairs in her pajamas for breakfast, there was a watery shape sitting at the table with close-cropped boy hair and a chainmail shirt. Good morning, Chloe said shyly as she took her seat, but the French girl stuck up her nose and refused to make conversation. Où sont mes ennemis? she asked. Her mother made her carry a thermos full of mud to school that day, and all her friends wanted to know if it was really Joan of Arc. All of her friends except Melissa, who had made it quite clear that they weren't friends at all anymore, not if Chloe had two saints. <laughs> Chloe didn't like Joan very much. Well, she tried, because here was another girl, and she too was best beloved, but, well, Joan was fierce. She smacked Chloe's fingers with the flat of her sword, and whenever Chloe put on a dress, Joan would scowl at the hemline. On days when she was particularly cross, she would set herself afire. And then she would writhe about as her skin went black and crispy. She would look at Chloe accusingly, her eyes burning with righteousness as the flames consumed her hair like a halo. Chloe tried to tell her mother, her mom at home, but she would only look on with approval. That's the way it's supposed to be, isn't it? Real martyrs have standards. And Chloe supposed she was right. Even so, at night when the room was dark with shadows and Chloe could feel the night terrors coming on, she still found herself wishing that the fire in Joan's eyes helped just a little bit. On Friday morning, Chloe packed her Hello suitcase 
and waited by the door for her dad to pick her up. She'd been looking forward to the visit all week. She'd been extra good, so Joan hadn't had to immolate herself even once since Tuesday. Her mother, though, had taken to pacing in the kitchen. She was always like that on the day of a visit, always tense and strange. Come here, Chloe, her mother said, and that thing, whatever it was that only came on visit days, was there in her eyes. She placed a glass of something black and sludgy in front of Chloe. I want you to drink this, darling. I made it for you special. I'm not thirsty, Mom, said Chloe, but even though she didn't want to, she could see the tips of Joan's hair starting to light up. So she gagged and she coughed and she sputtered, but she managed to drink it all. Good, said her mother. There's a dear. And she hugged Chloe very tightly. But then the, her dad rang the doorbell and Chloe ran to him and flung her arms around his neck. Her mother said nothing, she never did, but Chloe didn't mind because he was picking up her suitcase and then they were out the door. In the car, Chloe began to feel quite ill. Would you like something to drink, sweetheart, her dad asked, but Chloe said no, she didn't. Are you hungry? Do you need to pee? And Chloe still said no. Something strange was happening to her skin. First it started to itch, and then it started to prickle with sweat. And then, and then it started to burn. Dad, she said, what's wrong, sweetie? Should I pull over? Dad, she said again, but this time her voice sounded small and frightened. And Chloe couldn't recognize it because all she could hear was, mon père, mon père. Chloe spent the weekend in bed with a fever of 105. Her mum, her other mum, laid washcloths on her forehead, but nothing helped. Nothing stopped that feeling of fire looking at her skin, of her hair shriveling up. Sometimes she would catch sight of Lucia by her window, shaking her head sadly, the blank spaces of her eyes as dark and as cool as a well. And then she could only whisper, mon dieu, mon dieu. Her parents would exchange glances between them, and they looked so scared and small beside the bed. Chloe wanted to reach out to touch her mom's hair, but she was afraid the flames that licked her fingers like birthday candles might devour it. Chloe could hear bits of the phone conversation floating up to her through the floorboards, not even words anymore, just bits of anger and sadness and fear and fury all tied into one. They couldn't take her home. They were afraid to move her. They didn't know what was wrong, and so on Sunday her mother came, and when Chloe saw her, she didn't seem small like her parents. She seemed huge, hulking, and massive. Her legs were like two ionic pillars, and her face seemed carved from marble. It was so firmly set. She glared until her other mom fled the room. What have you done, David, her mother said. And her dad hung his head miserably, and he slunk out too. Then her mother sat down by the bed where her other mom had kept the washcloths. She touched her daughter's hair the way she did when Chloe had been very young. I love you, she said, my little girl my darling, and I'm sorry this is so hard, but it's not supposed to be easy, is it? Real love isn't ever easy. Sometimes it's hard and sometimes it hurts, but if it's real love, then you don't ever leave. You don't, no matter how much it hurts. I want you to know that. I'm here with you now, my darling, and I won't ever leave. And her mother stroked her face lightly with fingers that were hard and sharp as broken bones. This is their house and they want you to pretend that it is yours. They want you to pretend that you are their child, that you belong to them. But you don't love. You are my daughter. Your hands are my hands, and your fingers are my fingers, and your eyes, oh my darling girl, your eyes are my eyes. And she cradled her daughter's head very gently in the crook of her arm, and the pain was bad. The pain was very bad. But Chloe's Chloe loved her mother very much. And she was willing to bear the pain for her. She was willing to let the fire devour her if that was what her mother wanted, because that was what love was. It was fire, and it was torture, and it was being hacked to pieces, and broken fingers, and knives, and hammers, and arrows, and spears, and it was being drowned, and it was being suffocated, and it was being locked up in dark, dark places. She knew that. She knew that in the deepest, deepest bit of her. And she loved her mother enough to bear the pain Really she did, enough not to ask why or for how long she would suffer, for how long she must bear the weight of her love. But even so, even so, Chloe looked up through the halo of fire into her mother's eyes, wet with tears, real tears, because she hated seeing her daughter in pain. She reached up gently, shyly, 
and she felt the skin cool beneath her fingertips. And then, and then it was hard because she hated the darkness and she was afraid. She was truly afraid, but she could see Lucia standing by the window. And Lucia looked so beautiful, calm, patient, and kind. Everything she had ever thought love was. And so Chloe plucked out the eyes from her skull, just like that, just like a soap bubble popping. And it was done. 